Okay, well, as, as, as Harry said, this is um, um, come out of this. Is, what I'm going to talk about is work that's on the, um, the outputs from uh, desk based uh, exercise that we've been doing um, over the last uh, few months. So, what I'm going to cover is um, in terms of complexity, risk, and uncertainty for decision making and planning. Okay, so what's the problem? Um, some uh, discussion of what the concepts are, the theory uh, and, and definitions, um, how complexity, risk and uncertainty have been managed in the past, what might be appropriate, what is appropriate, uh, what tools and methods there are around, uh, and some conclusions. Uh, and I think I'm going to, to go through pretty quickly, so uh, but. Uh, the, the full paper that we've written will, will be available to you all uh, via the website and you've got um, a handout of, of all the slides. <coughs> uh, this, this is in part to set the scene. It's saying uh, we've, got, we've got projects, we talk about uh, mega projects, but they, they, they can include um, they can encompass uh, programs of projects that sum together uh, and they uh, may form part of uh, plans. Uh, plans may contain projects and vice versa. Um, and each of those projects, programs and plans, each that they have in common that there is a process involved, they each have objectives, and they each have their own particular uh, context. Uh, Right, so this is really what's the problem. We talk about, in day-to-day -day life, we talk about uh, Murphy's Law, if it, if it can go wrong, it will. Um, law of unintended consequences. Um, all sorts of things happen that you don't anticipate. Um, and uh, this phrase, wicked problems. So what... Wicked problems, they, they have a certain set of characteristics. They were really first talked about in the uh, early 1970s. Um, they have this characteristic um, interconnectedness. Um, strong connections link each problem to other problems. That's, so that solutions aimed at one problem um, uh, have, have the potential to generate important uh, side effects. They're complicated in the sense that they characterized by feedback loops uh, <coughs> and um, they're, they're characterized by uncertainty. Um, <coughs> uh, there is ambiguity in, uh, as a result of that problems can be seen in quite different ways by different parties uh, depending on their particular interests and, and, and loyalties and their perspectives. Um, <clears throat> they exhibit uh, conflict resulting from these completing, competing rather, uh, claims and, and interests. Um, <clears throat> and social constraints exerted by pre prevailing social, political, technological and political forces and capabilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but what um, has been observed is that if you like, the opposite of these, tame, tame problems can be solved by conventional analytical methods, uh, whereas wicked problems have no objective measures of success, uh, they require iterative steps and, and possess no right or wrong solution, really. it's just uh, only better or worse. And really, Wicked problems begin to make sense in a way when we consider um, complexity and compl you know, complexity theory and complex systems. And uh, complex systems have a whole, again, a, a, a string of, of characteristics. They're characterized by um, uh, emergence. They're, they're more than just complicated in that uh, behaviours and patterns emerge in complex systems as a result of relationships of the, the elements. Uh, relationships uh, are 
uh, short range that this information is normally received from near neighbors, then the relationships are non-linear. There's rarely a simple cause and effect relationship between the elements. Uh, they're characterized by feedback loops. They are open systems. Um, and complex systems have a, uh, a history. Um, a small change in circumstances can lead to large deviations in the future. And the boundaries are difficult to determine uh, because they're, they're open systems. Um, <clears throat> and they're usually defined on the basis of the needs and prejudices of the observer. So they, they have a number of uh, implications um, when they come to look at, at decision making and planning. Uh, the first of these is the, the inability to predict. What uh, complexity theory tells us is that um, Is that um, is that uh, these systems have uh, what's known as sensitivity to initial conditions? Small differences in the initial conditions can make a huge difference as time goes by. <coughs> um, the the implications for planning and strategy is that um, um, accurate prediction is not really uh, possible. Uh, hence. Uh, um, perhaps the phrase, the only certainty is that the plan will go wrong. Um, hence there is a, an inability to control. Um, from a planning point of view, um, the most crucial aspect of complexity theory is that it states that it's impossible to control what happens to the complex system. Uh, they exhibit uh, this uh, number of self-organization and emergence <clears throat> uh, as a result of the relationships and interactions of the constituent agents. Um, the characteristics of emergent order are that it forms spontaneously, that it cannot be directed. Um, <clears throat> they also um, operate under a small a set of uh, can operate on a set of simple rules, um, and the uh, in the paper I talk about um, phenomena to do with uh, the uh, flocking of birds or the shelling of fish, which operate under simple rules to do with separation, alignment, and cohesion. Three simple rules, but they exhibit a very uh, complex uh, pattern. Um, okay, moving on to uh, complexity sort of sets the overall scene. Uncertainty, um, uh, it has been described as an expression of confidence about the state of knowledge in a given situation. Uh, and I've, I've quoted there this uh, well-known um, well quotation from Donald Rumsfeld. Um, the message is that there are known knowns. There are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things that we do not know we don't know. And each year we discover a few more of those unknown unknowns. Now, he managed to stand up and say that without notes, but um, that's quite remarkable. Um, but um, I, th I think I want to try and shed a little bit of light on, on that as we go through as well. Uh, and perhaps we can, uh, some of you will, uh, I'm sure, understand totally what that means. But um, uh, part of my work was a journey to try and understand uh, what that was really all about. Uh, and uh, one way of looking at it is um, through this very simple two by two matrix. Uh, the two dimensions are uh, current status of, of knowledge from the known to the unknown, and uh, what I've called the uh, amenability, 
say, amenability to analysis from the knowable to the unknowable. And we can try and uh, map what Rumsfeld was saying in, into this two by two space. Um, so I'll sh sh show that there, one being the known knowns, two the uh, unknown and, and knowable in the future, uh, three struggling this uh, space currently unknown but not entirely unknowable, and then four is this area of residual uncertainty. Uh, and I think uh, to a large extent uh, that's the area occupied by uh, complex systems. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a, a taxonomy, as it says here, of imperfect knowledge, which uh, was de developed by a gentleman called Brown uh, and published fairly recently. I won't go through that because of the time, but uh, you may like to examine that, which, um, well, the dimensions are vertical axis, known outcomes and known uh, probabilities, and then uh, on the horizontal axis is about these uh, realms of confidence, as they're called, from certainty across to indeterminacy. I think that can be quite a, a useful uh, framework. Um, <coughs> okay, roots, roots of uncertainty. Uh, I've talked about complexity. Uh, another feature of complexity is this non-linearity. Um, those two are, are really part of the same thing. Uh, other um, causes of, uh, of uncertainty are to do with scale. <coughs> uh, a situation or a problem is too large or interconnected to observe everything at once. Again, really an aspect of complexity. Um, the opposite of transparency, opacity, if that's the right word. Um, the situation is too opaque to be observed. You can't really see what's going on. And capacity, there are inadequate resources to observe really what's, what's <coughs> happening. Uh, and this is just um, a, a simple diagram to, sh to try and represent uh, the relationships uh, between uh, complexity uncertainty and risk. Um, <coughs> those, those causes of um, uncertainty um, contributing <coughs> there uh, and uncertainty um, generates uh, risk and I'll come on to risk in a moment. Uh, and across the bottom there I just put in to remind me that we've got the dimension of time on in as well. This is a a dynamic, uh, changing situation all the time. Those patterns of uh, uncertainties will change, the causes will be changing all the time, and the levels uh, and nature of risk will be, will be changing. <coughs> right, meanings of risk. Um, well, this is an area that uh, uh, John Adams is, I'm sure, going to uh, say a, a lot about, so I don't, I don't even mention John here. So, <laughs> uh, I've, tried to, I've tried to cover some, some of the other ones. Uh, I'm sure John will give us a, an ex exposition of his view of, of risk. Um, I've just taken a, a number of definitions because it does mean different things to different people and in different contexts it has a different meaning. Um, so uh, the dictionary definition is along the lines of the, the possibility of, of suffering harm or loss. Um, um, health and safety definition might be something along the lines of, uh, uh, well, it's linked, it's associated with hazards or accidents. Um, a, a toxicologist um, um, has, um, I found, came across a view which is to do with uh, measurements of hazard and the exposure to that, that hazard. Um, uh, Ulrich Beck uh, talks about the un unintended and inescapable consequences of modernity uh, identified through science and, uh, um, uh, um, and there is, is uh, well at work on uh, the risks 
society, which is built around that sort of definition. Um, and uh, project managers, the associated project managers is the last one. Um, risk is an uncertain event that, should it occur, will have an effect on the achievement of the project objectives. So depending on um, the context in which it use, it's used, it has a series of, of different meanings. <clears throat> uh, looking now at the uh, responses to managing uncertainty. Um, one, one word that's uh, used here um, is um, sort of denial, really, the, the, the term closure. Um, it's it's um, delimiting uh, uh, an investigation by imposing artificial boundaries around the problem. So I've called it here for um, convenience, closed ears, that's the willingness to accept alternative views. Uh, the closed bank, um, absence of resources to consider uh, the, the, the problem. Uh, closed eyes, deliberately ignoring a problem. Uh, and closed minds, ignoring alternative views from others. <coughs> uh, another phrase that we, we hear in responding to uncertainty, bounded rationality uh, from, from Simon. Decision makers confine their perception of a situation to the goals and activities of their specific and immediate domain. Um, they try not to tackle that which is out there outside their, their comfort zone in a way. <clears throat> um, a, uh, a, a piece of uh, <coughs> research that was done uh, fairly recently on to, into um, uh, uh, large IT projects came across uh, this, uh, the empirical, empirical evidence of this sort. It, it, it found that uh, uh, those working on those projects um, uh, denied uncertainty, refused to reveal to stakeholders the risks and related information that might hold negative or discomforting connotations. Um, uh, avoiding uh, uncertainty, lack of attention to <coughs> risk related information due to insufficient trust or belief in that information, uh, delay, failure to consider or resolve risk due to uh, ignorance, a general lack of awareness. Um, and one of, one of the outcomes that uh, we find is uh, uh, in a number of situations is this issue of uh, optimism bias. By intentionally uh, or unintentionally uh, failing to, to manage expectations. If you're denying um, this, uh, failing to respond adequately to uncertainty, there is a tendency to be over-optimistic about outcomes or delivery. <clears throat> um, this, this um, we, we find in project management, for example, um, there's a common sets of techniques to uh, manage risk and uncertainty, uh, but they, uh, the establishment of risk registers and so on, but they rely on quantitative data that focus on uh, predicting and controlling the risk to uh, concentrate on events rather than uh, uh, to the exclusion of processes. Um, they just rely on historic data that, which cannot necessarily tell them too much about the future. Um, and they don't deal with any unanticipated risks. <coughs> um, you get methods uh, in, in project methods from systems engineering, systems analysis, um, <coughs> influenced, um, that have influenced the, the, the way that project management has, has developed. Um, but they, they adopt um, what can call a, a hard assumptions about the world, hard systems view of the world. <coughs> and lots of projects have been perceived to fail due to project managers not paying sufficient attention soft criteria. <coughs> um, the, 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 
paradigm of uh, rational comprehensive planning uh, that's set out there <coughs> is a uh, familiar one, but again, that's, that developed from a sort of hard system view of the world. Um, uh, Rosenhead, who's a, a professor at uh, LSE, um, looked at characteristics of his view of the characteristics of the dominant planning paradigm, uh, and he juxtaposed that. He looked at the, he, he established that it largely failed in dealing with uh, complex complexity and uncertainty. And um, contrasted on the left here, the, the, the dominant planning paradigm, as he called it, against the, he took the diametric, the opposite, and uh, arrayed that against the, the dominant paradigm, and came up with what he thought was a much more appropriate um, model for dealing with complexity and uncertainty and risk. Um, I'm going to have to rush this, I'm sorry about this. Um, so I won't go through that in any detail. Um, the tools that we might need then to address complexity, uncertainty and risk, uh, they've got to deal with context, complexity, uh, uncertainty, to focus on decisions, um, look at the qualitative rather than the quantitative necessarily, the inclusive, coherent, transferable, and scalable to different situations. I looked at, um, and, and from what uh, work I've done so far, uh, I've got looked at hard and soft systems, or cut out from the work, hard and soft systems, the, the uh, strategic uh, choice approach scenarios and uh, sense-making, which is uh, David, David Stone's area, the Kinevian approach. Um, I've contrasted here, uh, I'm very conscious of the time, I've got about six minutes, so uh, I've contrasted here the characteristics of hard systems and soft systems against a series of different dimensions as to how you distinguish one from another. Uh, problem-solving approach. So I'll talk about the clarity of goals, uh, the tangibility of those goals, how success is measured, uh, the permeability of uh, projects. Are they subject to external influences uh, or, or are they not? And the hard ones are the ones that are um, either artificially or um, in, in fact um, insulated from external influences, um, the number of solution options that are generated, the degree to which there's participation and, and practitioners, uh, and, the, and the practitioner role, the role of the expert, or the uh, wider involvement of stakeholders. And then there's the area of expectation of stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> and, and there is a way of, of mapping that in the sort of spider diagram. We can, we can characterize any particular project with this sort of mapping technique against those, those dichotomies, those scales um, that I've just described, which might be quite useful, uh, usefully developed for some of our case studies perhaps. <clears throat> uh, soft systems methodology comes from, uh, largely generated by uh, uh, Peter Checkland in uh, Lancaster some 30 odd years ago uh, and it continues to be widely applied. Um, it is about, um, it uses a systems view to, to model purposes and boundaries and relationships rather than the system itself uh, and uh, it deals explicitly with, with uh, uncertainty uh, and it's an open and accessible approach. Uh, strategic choice, um, the, the great champion of this has been uh, John Fenn again. This uh, goes back some, back to the late 1960s uh, when he, he 
he published his first work on, on uh, planning and uh, strategic choice. Uh, he moved into strategic choice when he realized the inadequacies of the um, sort of rational, deductive um, way of looking at things um, through operational research and found it lacking. Um, that's still got uh, plenty to offer, I think. Um, and this is a, a, a framework of um, the way he looks at um, uncertainties of the environment, values, and related decisions, uh, and um, what actions can be taken, what methods are used, and um, the outcomes that can improve the decision-making situation. I looked at scenario planning, um, really, gathered pace in, uh, in the 1970s uh, with, uh, sorry, 19, yeah, 1970s with the work of uh, Shell. <coughs> sorry, it's got slightly out of sequence. Um, I won't go through these, I'm sorry it's been so rushed here. I think I'd better, um, I looked at strategic choice. Um, um, Snowden tells us that we need, um, in advancing decision making, to look at complexity in the context of decision making. We need we need sense making capability to understand the complexity of decision making environment, and um, and we need in order to deal with that we need different management and planning methods, um, and he has this uh, Kinevian framework which includes the known, the knowable, uh, complex, and chaotic. Uh, <coughs> on the left-hand side, I'm oh, sorry, on the right-hand side is what he calls directing <coughs> order, uh, more the sort of uh, closed system territory. And on the uh, left-hand side uh, is emergent order, when we're dealing with complex and chaotic systems. Uh, and his work con uh, concentrates on this emergent order, this, this <coughs> left hand side, the complex and the chaotic, and how to deal with that in decision making. <coughs> he uh, proposes a number of what he calls response models, how to deal with these different domains uh, in terms of how, how one goes about uh, making uh, choices about actions. Um, Uh, very quickly then, a number of conclusions um, Right, for projects, programs and plans um, Right, we've seen complexity generates uncertainties uh, in the decision environment um, I think actually so just for a short of time, I'll go on to the second one, which is uh, conclusions for planning. Um, what, what this work showed us, shows us is we, that we need the right uh, analogy, if you like, for, for cities, for environments. Um, cities used to be regarded in the 1960s or so with the, the systems view of planning as it was then. Uh, cities were seen as machines. Really, the right analogy is something like a organism rather than a machine, uh, a complex adaptive system. Um, <coughs> there's the, really the demise of the, um, the sort of rational deductive model of the planning process. There's mounting evidence of its inappropriateness in the context of uh, complex, open, uncertain and adaptive environments. Um, I think I've shown you a number of promising areas uh, of tools and techniques, uh, systems, subsystems, strategic choice, um, and um, the, the, the work of uh, Snowden. Um, <coughs> not, not, not everything in a, in a project and plan is complex, though. We mustn't forget that. Uh, and I think we can see in every project um, elements of the closed system that might be the civil engineering of the, the infrastructure, uh, 
grew to um, more closed and uh, rather more open and, and complex issues to do with the social consequences of uh, the new facility or service, for example. And um, we really uh, need a more appropriate, a different planning paradigm. Uh, the conclusions have major implications for the planning process. Uh, we're shifting attention from end state plans towards more day to day operational decisions, from divining a, a blueprint to be pursued to understanding the consequences of actions, from reliance on experts to dialogues with stakeholders. Okay, a bit breathless, thank you very much.